Welcome to Alpha Talks Editor's Roundtable, What Moved Markets This Week for the week ending Friday, March 12th, 2021. A very interesting week that started off with some selling until one David Tepper came in with his call, basically being bullish on stocks and bearish on bonds. And that lifted things and caused some pretty sustained buying that has for the most part persisted through today, Friday. The major indices are up for the week. The NASDAQ has been banged around a little bit, up one day down the next, it is now down about 1% for today, Friday, as we record this around noon. But I am very curious about what my co-panelists have to say about all this, and let me introduce them now. I am joined once again by, in no particular order, Brad Olison, VP of News, Kim Kahn, Senior News Editor, Stephen Alfer, Managing Editor of Breaking News. I am your host, Nathaniel E. Baker, Senior Editor of Strategic Contributors here at Seeking Alpha. All right, let's start off with Kim, as we normally do, to give us the big picture overview of what moved markets this week. Well, this week we've had some unpredictable trading, I'd say, if you're, especially if you're looking at the NASDAQ, which has been up one day, down the next, back up again. And I think we've got a lot of push and pull between um, uh, the, the tech dip buyers who keep coming in and scooping up um, shares when it gets, the, gets to their liking, and, and then the, the rate jitters crowd who's you know, gotten the eye on the 10-year yield and you know, worrying about spikes that are going to you know, hit the mega cap stocks again. Um, it was an, also an interesting week for the yields. I mean, everybody was kind of pretty tame for most of through the week until today when they're kind of they're spiking right through 1.6% on the 10-year. Um, looks like it's uh, Biden's promise to have all adults eligible for the vaccine by May 1st. It's giving kind of the, you know, the excuse to push bond prices down. Um, you know, but the, you know, the Treasury market didn't navigate some things that were supposed to be stumbling blocks like these um, had three big auctions of, of treasuries, which had pretty much tepid demand, but didn't have much impact on, on yields and, and certainly not on stocks, even though the market, stock market had a, uh, one eye on them. And uh, uh, also an interesting thing I saw is the divergence we're seeing between the NASDAQ and the Dow, which is getting a, obviously a price-weighted index. The Dow is getting a lot of boost from the cyclicals like Boeing and Goldman Sachs. And um, a Bespoke Investment Group uh, came out with a chart uh, kind of showing that when these really big days of, of splits between the, the, the price of the NASDAQ and the, and, or the gains in the NASDAQ and the drop of the Dow or vice versa are clustered around points that usually are right before another leg up in equities. So we'll see about that. Interesting. Yeah, and it wasn't all Tepper here. There, there were a couple of economic reports, specifically the inflation report that came in pretty much exactly in line with expectations that kind of uh, put some of these fears aside, at least what, where the bond market was concerned. And then we also had a uh, initial jobless claims yesterday that was also pretty much in, in line with estimates, but either way, not enough to get people freaking out one way or the other. All right, where does that leave us with winners and losers, Brad? So try something a little different this week, given the fact that, we, did, as we did mention, it was just broad-based buying across the board. There were only about 13 or you know a handful of, of losers in the S&P 500 this week, basically because of all this post-cyclical buying and just general optimism that persisted. Some of the losers were... You know, the interesting names that had already run up this past month in the double digits, like Royal Caribbean, Norwegian Cruise, and Live Nation. But we had some COVID scares to, to kind of, uh, you know, take some of the shine off those cruise lines. And GE was also a big loser, but that's just because they had a major divestiture um, slash merger agreement that didn't go as, as well as analysts had hoped. I guess it, it muddies the water for some of the remaining business units um, that are struggling from a structural basis. So given the fact that it would just you know, several hundred of the S&P constituents were higher. I figured uh, it'd be best to look at some different winners in the market that we don't normally speak about. And the one main winner that I saw was direct listings generally. Roblox was the big uh, new 
found publicly traded entity. It's a gaming platform, RBLX, uh, opened for trading this week 50% above its reference price. So the reference price for some is just, it's an exchange set approximation of where the stock should trade. And obviously the market makers deemed that there was enough demand to, to warrant opening the, the shares 50% above what where it had previously been trading in the private markets. Um, I guess part of that is maybe the fact that 50% of America's children are all on this platform in some or way or another. So, uh, you know, check your kids' screen time um, if you're not already. And then the second winner that I saw was NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So uh, if we thought the Bitcoin craze is has been picking up steam, take a look at the NFT world where this is basically a crypto asset. Uh, it could be anything. It could be sports videos that, uh, you know, a snippet from the N NBA that will sell for a hundred, couple hundred thousand dollars, basically, in, uh, I guess the rights to an image. Um, and then the, the notable news this week was, I guess, an artist who had stitched together thousands of JPEG images or something along those lines uh, named Beeple, who sold that JPEG crypto image for $69 million dollars in an auction. And these NFTs, these non-fungible tokens can be just about anything. So they can be GIFs or GIFs or memes or just about whatever you'd like to to yeah. uh, cryptonize. In, in fact, I, I this week I offered up for sale my tweets. I've been tweeting since 2008 and the starting price is $1 million. If you're interested, you can follow me on Twitter and get in touch with me there. But this is What's the really price for Jack Twitter's or uh, Jack Dorsey's initial tweet up to how much did he get? Is, is the is the bidding closed yet? I don't. I, I know the I last know. price was pretty pretty high. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, above two million last time. But okay, so I'm half of that. So that's not terrible. actually. But Ark Invest was out saying that NFTs are going to unlock more value for content creators than anything in history. Hmm. We'll see. I mean. A lot of people, and I, I kind of have to agree with this a little bit, would say that this is just a sign of interest rates being too loose for too long, there being too much money sloshing around the system, and this being yet another sign of peak markets, uh, at least peak risk taking. If you're investing in these digital assets that are worth, you know, literally exactly what people are bidding for them with no underlying intrinsic value of any kind. Hey, look at stamps, baseball cards, they've all been around for quite some time. What true value do they have but what people want to pay? Yeah, but I mean, that was, baseball cards are something that were manufactured. I know it's a little cardboard thing, but it's at least it's a physical thing. You know, these are just, anyway, whatever. Yeah, and so I, I was that. that, you know, there's there's hardly a business cycle that goes by where, where Jim Grant or someone of that ilk doesn't point to a, a Christie's auction of some piece of artwork yep. selling for $175 million and saying, yeah, this is, a, this is the result of the casino society we have. So now... Now we can say the same thing about NFTs. So. Yeah, good point. Good point, Stephen. While I have you, what was what caught your eye this this week, and, and what are you thinking about? Uh, a couple couple things. One is is uh, as Kim talked about, kind of the continued kind of uh, rotation or, or out out of out of the Nasdaq and into the Dow, and it, it's really it's it's the reversal of the uh, of the COVID play, right? So this this doesn't take place in it doesn't take place in a day. This built up over a long time. The Nasdaq's outperformance built up all over all last year, and it's. I think it's going to continue to unwind as we reopen. So the the COVID stocks are going to need a, a new uh, a new storyline for that their next run higher, and and a lot of these stocks that have been beaten down because of the lockdowns, um, you know, they should be doing just fine as the economy reopens, as a, the stimulus money starts to hit. Mm. Uh, so I think it's going to be a kind of a recurring thing, you know, mm. over, over, the, over the coming months. Uh, yeah. As far as specific corporate news, uh, a story we did about um, Disney, their streaming service is at 100 million subscribers now. And four weeks ago, it was about 86 million. And four weeks before that, it was in the, in the low 70 millions. Uh, so, so really stunning growth. They've, you know, we've talked about it before in this show. They've, they've, they've turned themselves in, uh, in a space of a few months into a streaming company. Um, their gains have been great. The gains for some of the other broadcasters who have also morphed into streaming companies, think of uh, Viacom, Discovery, have been extraordinary. And uh, they're kind of coming at the expense of Netflix, which is struggling. Uh, there's obviously going to, there's a lot more competitors now, and, uh, and they're all going to have to spend, you know, big bucks for content. And, uh, and I think that's taken a little bit of a hit to Netflix. Mm. Yep. 
All right, let's take this. That takes us to the section of the week where we discuss uh, favorite stories. I initially intended this section to be where we discuss articles of, from contributors, but with all of my co-panelists being on the news side, they ended up discussing news stories, which is fine as well. But let's start with Kim and, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to follow up on um, what Steve just said about streaming. And, um, you know, the, um, you know, I think Viacom CBS is now looking at a, a 12th uh, straight day of gains. Um, there's a couple of uh, uh, competing opinions. Moffat Nathanson says that Paramount Plus is enough for Viacom to, to now be considered a growth stock. But, but City is, as was out bullish today, um, pointing to Paramount Plus and, 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 and the strength of this. And, and it's like, there's too many. You know, tailwinds to be bearish on it, um, but also how Netflix is out today. Um, well, this, we have a story out today um, about how Netflix is looking to stop people from sharing their passwords. Mm -hmm. And that's something that they've always kind of turned a blind eye to. It's been something that they've never really been enforcing. But now people are seeing things, uh, messages pop up on their screen saying, well, you have to be in the same household if you're going to use this password and then ask, ask to either put in a text or an email code. I think they can defer verify. that. I think they can defer that too. I think it's like a soft, a soft hurdle at this point. I don't think they're they're all too serious, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah. it's. I mean, it's. I'm, but now, I mean, now with 200 million subscribers, obviously they're looking for, and you know, Disney is you know kind of catch is like you know, in their rearview mirror. They're going to look for something kind of moves to get some revenue out of the out of the people that are sharing with all their buddies. Yeah, there's a Bruce Springsteen song, uh, 57 Channels and Nothing On, from the early 90s, when cable news and cable channels were kind of adding all these all these channels. And it kind of reminds me a little bit, because there's all these cable, uh, you know, streaming channels, but there doesn't seem to be anything I really want to watch. You guys ever have that experience? Like, I just, I'll, I'll open up Amazon Prime, no, no. Netflix, no, no. YouTube, no. And then I just end up doing whatever. Read a book, Never. maybe. <laughs> What's that? Do you open a book? Sorry. No, oh, no <laughs> absolutely not. Come on, yeah. no, no. Maybe a Kindle, but no. Come on, books are. That's, that's, I could always find something. There's like 50 seasons of CSI out there. There's always something. You got to find a good I know, series. But, but then that's like a too big of a commitment for me to start. <laughs> like, you know, it's, so then it's just like no, and then I'll be up all night watching it, and, and it's just like oh, so. Yeah, anyway. Maybe that's just a personal problem. So maybe I'll, well, I'll remove that. I mean, Okay, uh, Brad, what about you, favorite stories? Uh, speaking of 57 whatevers and nothing on, uh, we can talk about electric vehicle upstarts um, and how so many of them are now struggling. Uh, over the past few weeks, the share prices have come down dramatically. There's been something like $750 billion in market cap lost over the past three, four, five weeks. Um, that has come out of Tesla, that's come out of uh, Neo and Xpeng and Lordstown Motors, which just had a short call on it just today, um, and, and quite a few names. And a lot of that is due to the very, the, the same issues that Steve and Kim were just referring to in the streaming wars. This is just, there are concerns about competition. Um, and also, you know, are, is there just enough money to be made all around? I guess the, the flip side of that, po that coin is Volkswagen just uh, this past week mentioned that they expect 70% of the, the European car market will consist of electric vehicles at one point. But it's obviously whether these companies will grow into their valuations, which have just gotten so far uh, potentially ahead of where they need to be. As we all know, Tesla does make money. A lot of it is due to tax credits. Um, and they're the, the leader in the space. So where does that lead? all these other names like Fisker. Um, but I guess it, it, it was just interesting to me that we have a, a lot of these names that are 30 to 50% off of their 52 week highs. So if you were looking for a chance to get into a name like Workhorse or uh, others like that, you know, and you wanted to buy on the dip, you're seeing that dip now. Stephen, what about you, favorite stories? Uh, Ted Mathis, uh, for those of you who don't know who he is, he's the chairman and CEO of New York Life. Uh, a little insurance company with $700 billion in assets under management. He's joined the board of New York Dig, which is New York Digital Investment Group, crypto, Bitcoin. So, um, and he also is chairman of a group of life insurers with $7 trillion in assets under management. So the, uh, the story is the institutional acceptance of Bitcoin, uh, you know, it continues to take leaps forward. 
Um, the price of Bitcoin this week, I, I, it, was, it was up a bit. It challenged all time high. I didn't, um, but uh, you know, it's not really a, it's not really a call about the price of Bitcoin. It's more a call about the institutional acceptance. Uh, you combine that with what PayPal's been up to. They they purchased Curve this week. Uh, I think they finally closed on that deal, which is kind of digital, like online security, digital security, we'll call it. And um, you know, so we're pretty close to having basically a full crypto bank, like in your, you know, on your phone at this point that you can actually mm-hmm. transact with merchants. That you can save. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, so to me, that was a, a really a fun story this week. Okay. All right. Thank you all for listening. Uh, we look forward to speaking to you again next week. Reminder that if you are listening only and not watching, there is a video accompanying this with all kinds of neat stuff that you can check out on the website, seekingalpha.com slash videos. If you just watched the video, this was not a complete recording of everything that was said. To get that, you have to check out, you have to log into the podcast, the audio podcast that is through the Wall Street Breakfast account and posts every Saturday morning at around 6.30 a.m. That's it. Have a nice weekend. And we look forward to speaking to you again next week.